Welcome to Thrive Talks, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world today. Hi, I'm Rebecca from the Thrive Project, and we're a not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, I'm pleased to welcome Yasmin Abdeen. Hi there, Yasmin. How are you? I'm good. And hi, Rebecca. And how are you doing? I, I'm quite good. Uh, Yasmin is a highly motivated individual who has worked across many sectors throughout her career. She has extensive experience with strategic, political and general management responsibilities and also has substantial experience in organisational change. As a corporate trainer, she designs and conducts training solutions for organisations and she's also a passionate educator focusing on improving science communication. She likes to encourage thought-provoking discussions to help people connect their learning with real-world application. She also coaches undergraduates and conducts career preparation programs at institutes of higher learning. Welcome, Yasmin. That sounds like you're a very busy person, so thank you for taking the time with us. <laughs> well, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. What I want to talk about, because obviously Thrive is also in the business of trying to communicate scientific learning um, to a general mm -hmm. audience. So what I want to know is how important language and tone is in um, engaging audiences. There are several components that are very important. First of all, obviously, uh, we need to understand our audience competency with the language as well. Uh, yeah. So native speak of the language, I think, um, let's say someone who's Australian and you're speaking to an Australian audience, there's no real issue in them understanding anything you need to communicate. But for example, if you were going to come to Asia, you've got to be a little bit more mindful of the nuances and perhaps also you know, word choices, how they would understand a particular word so that's right. probably so that one there's thing. like translation issues as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course, because you know they're going to have be, their context. Yeah, they're going to process that information that you've given in English into their mother tongue, yeah. and then they'll have to process that back into English before they respond to you. So you know, there's always that kind of lapse of time, no matter how quick it can be done. Do you think that that contributes to like the somewhat stilted or formal language of academia? Oh, yes, definitely. For example, just to give you an idea of conversation that I had with my students, and these are students from Central Asia, mm -hmm. and so we're talking about tangible outcomes. And the idea of tangible is so different from how we understand tangible as well. You know? Okay. So, so, so what's concepts, their understanding of, of tangible? Tangible it seems to be like a lot more of an abstract co concept of, you know, something you you can't reach or you can't achieve but it's you know it's concrete but you can't reach it or you can't achieve it so oh so okay it, that's yeah, very so, different isn't it that's exactly like, yeah, yeah so that, that's obviously gonna affect so much and you can't even grasp like w w when you're trying to communicate you're not gonna be thinking about you know so when we talk about tangible word? outcomes they think it's like a big impossible goal to achieve yeah it. Oh, yeah okay. we're, we're, we're thinking like something you know actually okay, happening, real, like, like, physical, yes, like, like yeah yeah exactly you could do an edible garden and that's a tangible outcome right for us yeah I was thinking more about um the tone and that, like the types of word choice that, that you take because when you're talking to a general audience obviously they're not necessarily going to engage with a lot of very specific um, expert level language. They're not going to mm -hmm. maybe understand it or you, like basically it, it becomes word salad. You just see a bunch of really, really long words all together and you just go, <laughs> ah, I can't pass that. Um, so how do you communicate the same ideas with maybe easier, more approachable language without coming across as not an authority on the subject? One thing that helps is obviously having data that people can relate to or examples that they can sort of see a correlation to the point that we're making. And right. that helps them, you know, uh, provides an illustration, basically. You know, so so that basically makes, like yeah. using metaphors and, and communicating. Yes, or an analogy, for example. You know? Yeah. So it's similar to doing this. And then they go like, ah, okay, I get that now. Right. So uh, basically rephrasing it in in context that people will understand and relate to rather than trying to just 
dumb down the words. And of course, speaking makes a lot of difference as well. You've got to pace yourself a little differently when you're speaking to a non-native speaker of English so that they can understand everything you're saying. Slow it down a little bit and make sure it's clear. Yeah. How does that relate to the the issue of um, edutainment, as I call it, where education is becoming a commercial thing where it's 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 trying to be entertainment do you think that that's a good thing or a bad thing well I guess it depends on your audience so if you're looking at younger people Mm -hmm. uh, I'm someone who's a lot more mature I guess compared to you so I think with the younger generation who's grown up in a very digitalized world graphics and music and videos it really makes a difference for them it's engaging them basically making them interested and curious Right. Correct. But well, even a simple quiz or a game that you introduce in a segment that you're conducting basically yeah. changes the entire dynamics. I look after my nieces regularly and they've got like little tablets because they use tablets at school, which blows my mind. I'm like, she's five. <laughs> <laughs> and she, you know, she's learning on a on a tablet at school, but she's got like little games and stuff that Ooh. um educational games. And I, I'm like, wow, that's really great. Like what a great way to go hey, she's focusing on numbers, which numbers are bigger and smaller and things like that. And it's all gamified in a way that's fun and interesting to her. And I'm like, that's that's amazing. So different from when I, or, or I imagine you went to school as well. Like, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so another thing that I want to ask is mm-hmm. how uh, different teaching in a corporate training environment is to teaching in a university setting. So with university students, generally most of them are young adults or probably just fresh out of high school or secondary school, as we would call them here. And so their worldview might be a little bit more idealistic. You know, there's yeah. that kind of passion and how youth would say, I want to change the world and I want to do this and I want to do that. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the corporate sector, you've got people who've been in the industry for years. And yeah. so that, you know, in itself creates a very different learning experience is, is there well. more resistance from adult learners, do you think, because they already have an understanding of, of the world and how it works? Well, I think it all depends on the individual. I, I mean, I've seen them across the spectrum. So you would have people who are at 60 and say, I want to learn. I want to understand this a little better. Yeah. And then you have a 30-year-old and says, no, I've done that. And I know it was not going to happen. I know it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course. So it's very much an individual rather than, you know, an age factor or even a gender factor for that matter yeah okay so when you're like coming up with like a curriculum do you tailor that based on like what you expect to face in that environment oh yes definitely I do so for example um if I'm doing a cop a corporate training session I usually start by trying to understand their own experiences what have been their challenges so let's say we look at a design training workshop what are some of the common problems they've had and they had to troubleshoot and then how design thinking principles could actually help them find solutions that are more applicable yeah. to their situation. But let's say if I'm working with students, then it's more of introducing the principles of design thinking to them right? and, and to get them to see how this would apply in problem solving. So it's a slightly different approach. So it, you know, it's a little bit more theoretical based at the start and then building on the knowledge, whereas the other one is, okay, how have you done this? Oh, okay, so this is what you do. This is linked to that. How do so, you take that and, and resolve an issue where there are actually opposing goals? You can always look at creating a model that addresses most of these um, issues that they may have or the, the resistance that they may be facing, mm-hmm. and then a prototype that would work for all or perhaps have several prototypes. So let's say, okay, so for Rebecca, this is what I think would work for you. But for Yasmin, no, we've got something else. Right. Okay. So yeah. basically, you know, you, you're coming across it as as trying to tweak things in a way that pleases the most amount of people. Yes. Basically. Or, the, or the market that you're working in. Yeah. Right. Of course. Because you've got to have that market-based approach in, in the corporate world. What kinds of training have you done for corporations? Is it all just like design thinking? So um, usually it's kind of like a program that is scaled from one point to another. So we start off usually with problem solving skills and getting people to sort of see how each of us look at problems a little differently as well. 
And yeah. learning how to reframe a problem is one of the things that we, I usually do with them as well. Because how we look at a problem basically um, affects the way we would think of the solution. Let's say that, for example, somebody was like, I just, I'm overwhelmed. There's just like too much. What would your response to that person be? Okay, so first of all, if you were to tell me, Rebecca, I'm overwhelmed, my question to you would then be, what's overwhelming you? You know, like, is it work? Is it home? Is it relationships? So we kind of like compartmentalize it. So you break down the problem and then you can address the different parts. Yeah, I can see how that would be very helpful as a, as a process for people to learn in general in their lives, not just in work or in sustainability. <laughs> yes, because a lot of times when we're, let's say, overwhelmed, you know, it's just so many different things happening. And because we're looking at it as a whole, you know, the anxiety sets and the stress comes in. But yeah. if we're able to break it up into smaller parts, then we realize, okay, things at home are good. You know, my relationships are going well. Okay, so it's just this little project that I need to do and that's the one that's irking me. And why is it irking me? Okay, I've not done this before or maybe it requires me to learn something and I don't have the time to learn it. And then when you can sort of, you know, go down a little deeper, then you know what the issue is and then you decide, you know, what's the best way to work around this? When you're a person, you're looking at a corporation and you want to know whether that company's good or bad or, you know, how can you tell the difference between a company that's engaged in greenwashing or marketing spin versus one that's actually truly invested in being sustainable? We do have actually uh, an agency here in Singapore, for example, that gives companies some kind of a rating in terms of their green practices as well and buildings as well. Uh, We have the green mark in which the building authority says, okay, this is a environmentally friendly building like they recycle water or yeah. you know, they've done other things and oh. so there are some indicators but um well I guess it's not consolidated so how do you tell the difference I guess is to look at their practices as well you know what do they do uh, how do they communicate and what's happening at the ground level do they have initiatives that promote that sort of sustainable living I suppose you also have to be, you know, questioning like what what industries they're in as well. Like you yes. might go mining industry is, is maybe, you know, if, they, if they're promoting something as being sustainable, you go, well, is it? Are you sure? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. the question you go, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we don't have mining here in Singapore, but let's say a printing company. Yeah. You know, so you, you'll be wondering, okay, so how sustainable are you if you're doing in the printing business, right? Yeah, I've actually, I have a lot of friends in um, book publishing industry and I know that there's been like a, a big paper shortage at the moment that's happened with the, the COVID as well. And so there's been like this big pushback or like, because obviously that's something that gets printed, which is why I bring it up. But yeah, that books aren't being um, published. They've, they've had to put their dates off and stuff because they just don't have the supply of paper and it's just wild (laughs) yes exactly so and then you you hear of companies that are now using recycled paper I know that libraries for example when they fill up on on space they actually often just throw out the older books because they don't have room for them anymore and they just get rid of them and it's like well that's such a waste like even if people aren't wanting those books anymore reusing the paper would be a fantastic way to keep that going yeah and I also know that people uh, give away books as well. So yeah. there are always families that would need them or, you know, schools that would welcome books for their students or they do this sort of book exchange thing. Yeah. So we have different titles and then we swap. So Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool. That's like a, a community library sort of. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Um. Okay, so moving back to education a little bit here (laughs) a lot of information is actually freely available on the internet there's a lot of like free introduction level like sort of a one-on-one level Mm. classes and things like that there's also you can find academic papers that are often a bit impenetrable you know they might require a degree to actually understand what's happening them but you don't see a lot of education aimed sort of the middle ground somebody who's already read the 101 material and they understand that and they want to take the next step but you know that 
but they're not able to pass the actual expert academic papers. Are there any free resources that you could recommend to people who are curious and, and they want to learn more? Free resources? Okay. I wasn't yes. prepared for that, Rebecca. No, no, it's okay <laughs> if you don't. Like, that's just, yeah. I think one place that would help a lot of people is to go to research ResearchGate. Uh, there yeah. are good papers written by a lot of time PhD students or master level students, and they get them peer reviewed. Right. Okay. So that, you know, like the, the students, so it's, it's maybe a little bit more readable in that readable. sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yet it has substantial information that could help you, you know, go beyond, like you said, level one of understanding a topic. Yeah. yeah. That's just, I mean, that's something I've encountered as well. Just like, you know, you go on and there's like some really great, like YouTube series and stuff like that, that do give you like the basics in so much and I highly recommend them to anyone who's who's interested in in learning about all sorts of things. But yeah, moving beyond that is is somewhat challenging. You're right. It's good to know. I I, I would always suggest read research. Go to research kit because it's you don't you just need to create an account and then you just need to type in the subject matter and you can you can find that's 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 really good to know. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, now in the very digital world that we find ourselves in. Uh, there is a lot of misinformation that goes out and about there. How do you know for yourself as a, as a reader that something is is wrong and, and how do you challenge that as an educator? As a reader, what you need to do is to discern who's the author, who's writing this, who's behind this, you know, and you've got to be very careful who the, the company that's publishing it as well because yeah. um, corporate companies may have certain agendas Mm -hmm. which um, would kind of skew information in a certain manner. And that could be, you know, in that sense, fake or inaccurate, maybe. That's a real problem as well in, in academia is that you have corporate think tanks who literally that they pay scientists or researchers to find specific results and they sort of tweak the data sets a little bit to show what they want to show rather than giving a, a more accurate Yes, yeah. it does. So that's when you need to read extensively and compare the information as well. So you can't read one paper and say, okay, this is gospel truth. This is the word of the expert, right? Yeah. yeah. So you've got to compare that information with someone who's done something similar. Look yeah. across and then say, okay, why is this one saying something so different from everyone else? You know, that's not going to make sense. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like the, the vaccine thing where you, you might yeah. find that one doctor who's, who's saying, yeah, vaccines are bad, but all of the other doctors in the world are saying that they're good. You kind of yes. go, well, maybe that one doctor is wrong. I and guess. I think what's very important is for us as an individual to be very conscious of our own biases as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to look for information that validate our own opinions or our yeah. own ideas of something. So you go like, ah, oh, okay, this confirms it, you know, and yeah, I've got, got what I need, you know, to substantiate my claim or, you know, my perspective. Yep. Of so you, you don't look further than that yeah. because you're exactly. like, no, it backs me up, I'm validated, I'm good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so you've got to be conscious of this sort of biases we could have. And all of us have them. Uh, that's a reality. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people... They, they get um, offended, I suppose. They see it as a criticism of themselves to the idea that they might have prejudices or biases. But I think that it is important for people to understand that everyone has some kind of bias. It's just... Yes. They're blind spots and you've got to learn them so that you can navigate the world better, I suppose. Yeah, so listen when someone says, hey, I don't think that's right, and then try and find out why do you think you don't agree with me and then go get it confirmed you know in an objective manner I think that's very yeah, important yeah taking that approach how do you go about like as an educator I have found um in my interactions with with people who maybe buy into like conspiracy theories and things like that that you almost need to have a PhD in whatever field the conspiracy is in to even <laughs> grapple with the information like you know you go well I know you're wrong and I can sort of point you why you're wrong but I don't like they'll come up with really really fringe cases I suppose um to support their cases and, and it's just how, how do you grapple with trying to disprove something that someone's claiming 
I think, first of all, you need to understand um, the point of argument as well. So uh, there's several things. So, for example, one way a lot of people argue is with emotion. And yep. when they inject so much emotion into the topic or the issue, you know, we get clouded by that immense flow of emotion. We say, oh, they're so passionate. They must be true. Or, you know, yeah. they're speaking from the heart or she's, you know, she sounds so committed to this cause. And then we get clouded by the emotion and we forget that what's actually being said, whether it makes sense, it's logical and all. So I, I always tell people there are three things. First of all, does it make sense? When you hear it, is that something that makes sense to you? Yeah. Can the person provide an example? Yep. Backing you it know, up with the actual backing up, evidence. Yeah, with, with yeah. The evidence, data, you know not anecdotal information because yes. that doesn't count. You know, like, oh, my my dad's from best friend from university. Okay, that doesn't count because we don't even know who that is. Mm. So actual evidence and the person being able to explain it as well. When someone's saying something, but they're, they're sort of, I, I think that certain like speakers, they, they tend to use, I suppose, like, formal language and they are very confident in their approach so that they sound like they know what they're talking about but I've, I've noticed that in in some of those cases when you actually look at the words that they've said that there's no meaning there's nothing there <laughs> politicians do that <laughs> <laughs> the truth is out we know now <laughs> no I, I think you're spot on here Rebecca um you know, how we'll hear things like someone said, oh, we're monitoring the situation very closely. It doesn't tell you anything, actually. Yeah, it doesn't tell you. It's, it's just, it's spin. It's just a glossy statement. Yes, it's yes. a spin. You know, yes. we're putting in all appropriate measures. Now, if you start to think about it logically, why would you put in an inappropriate measure? When yeah, you put what, a measure what, in what is an appropriate? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why would you put in an inappropriate measure? Like, that's... That's yeah, not something anyone with a brain would do. Yeah, yeah, certainly not deliberately. But yeah, it's it's it is it's a lot of yeah. So it's all this sort of glossy statements. When you so when you hear it, go like, oh wow, they're doing so much. But when you think about it logically, why would you put anything that's inappropriate? You are expected to do something that's appropriate. So yeah. why aren't you telling us what it is? Yeah. How you're doing it? When you're doing it? Who's doing it? So all these questions. The specifics. Yeah, so if they can answer the question by telling you like how it's being done, why it's being done, and why this is better than an alternative, then you can be assured that, okay, maybe with all this data, there is some logic to this. Yeah. I mean, I think that something that people grapple with um, is, is the idea that people don't always know what they're doing. I think that people expect that maybe like all the politicians are, oh, they know what they're doing or, or something like, like there's a, a level of once you're at a level of authority, there's just an expectation and people turn off their critical thinking brains to examine what's actually happening there. Um, how, do, how do you encourage people to turn that back on and actually look at, you know, not just accept blindly what someone says because they're your boss or whatever you know in many cultures as well um, we respect authority and so mm -hmm. when we've been raised to respect authority we don't question authority yeah. we just accept it for what it is you know so I think what we need to start telling ourselves is that this person might be in that position but it doesn't make this person you know perfect and yeah. flawless. <laughs> you know so and but then when we start to think, okay, why are we doing this? Is there an alternative? Why aren't we not considering the alternative? Yeah. Or how can we do this better? And when we start to ask those questions, and if this person can provide a rational explanation for that cause of action that's being suggested. Then we can actually accept it, that. Yes. Yeah. yeah but if course. a person can't provide an explanation, then you've got to ask yourself, then why are we listening to this person? Do you see a lot of issues with people who are in academia, like, you know, they have their PhDs and they're an expert in a field, commenting on fields that they're not actually 
experts in? Do, do you see that happening? It does happen because sometimes even journalists would interview someone who's not an expert in that area just because someone has a doctor, doctorate or a professorship, right? And the mm-hmm. title itself creates credibility. Mm-hmm. It also, we just assume that because, let's say, if I was a professor, then I must be a, an expert in everything. Yeah, 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 I think that that's the idea. Like, you know, like you're an astrophysicist, you're not a biologist, for example. Exactly, like, yeah. Yeah. Even though, you know, it's in the field of science, but it's two very different areas. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. And I think people don't necessarily understand Notice it. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this comes also when you have, He's speaking on issues or endorsing things, and they're not experts. They're just popular individuals. Yeah, yeah, that that definitely actors and you know influencers yeah. and things like that. Like it's just they're just people that people like. Essentially, yes. there's no actual. So they, they have a base of people who follow them, but you again, you've got to ask yourself, you know, are they actually advocating for a cause or are they just advocating, you know, because it increases popularity? Yeah, yeah, they're advocating for themselves essentially, like they're jumping on a on a the train. Bandwagon, yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, Now, I know a lot of people who say that they don't see the value in education, um, particularly when it comes to higher education. So how do you go about informing people about the value in education and connecting the dots between what they learned in school and what they do in the real world? I mean, education itself is a huge umbrella word that refers to many different things, right? But if you're looking specifically at higher education, I think when you go into higher education, you get a kind of endorsement about the knowledge that you have. You also learn about things that have been, you know, uh, discovered by people in the field, models, Mm -hmm. theories, and that helps you validate your own ideas. It also helps you navigate situations that perhaps prior to getting this education, you wouldn't know what to do as well. Yeah. You know, um, if, for example, someone who's who's never gone to university and learn marketing. So a lot of times, maybe some of the actions could be a hit and miss kind of thing, you know, trial and error. It works this time, and how come it doesn't work the other time? But maybe if you've gone to school and you've done a business degree, then you learn some of these technical aspects that could help you reduce mistakes. And I mean, it, it, it gives well. you access to sort of like a meta-analysis of, mm-hmm. of information. Yeah, so you yeah. can better understand why something is working instead of just going yep that works this is what I'll do yeah and why does it work you can't explain it (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah exactly they just go oh I don't know why it works it just just that's the kind of thing your grandma would say right just do because I know it (laughs) yeah (laughs) my grandma it's actually um a story that I've heard that is like a really great metaphor for um examining traditions and and why we do things this woman was being taught by her mother how to prepare a, a meatloaf. And mm-hmm. um, before it went in the oven, she cut both ends off and, and threw them in the bin. And the girl's gone, you know, why do we throw, throw them away? That's very wasteful. And she's like, I don't know, this is just how I was taught to do it by my mother. Yeah. And, you know, she goes, okay, well, she goes to a grandmother to ask and goes, you know, why are we doing it this way? It, again, it's it's wasteful. And she's like, this is this is how we do it. I was taught this by my mother and that's why I taught it to my daughter. And so she eventually, she goes to her great grandmother who, who did that and she's like looking at them going, I did that because the pan was too small and it didn't fit with the ends <laughs> on, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it, it was an, an action that, that she took because it was appropriate to that situation but yeah being taught going yes. forward it wasn't actually necessary um, exactly yeah yeah I mean that's how we learn because we model what other people do as well if you think about it you know we observe yeah. and then we just model those behaviors of- yeah we, we copy we, we learn from example and and that's yeah but it, it's why it's important to be critical in how we're learning and, and thinking about why we're doing what we're doing and not just 
yeah, mimicking, I suppose. <clears throat> exactly. So when you start to ask those questions and then you get the answer and then you decide, do I want to continue doing it this way? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can actually make an informed decision. decision. About your yes. yeah. yeah, very important. Now, some people have accused education of brainwashing their children, and that particularly when they go off to university, as an example, they're like, oh, I don't want you going to college. It's all the kids get brainwashed there and, you know, what, what, <laughs> what, what would you say to those people to sort of, convince them that maybe it's not brainwashing? I think what happens in universities across the world is that when a young person goes in, he or she develops the critical thinking skills. They become a more objective individual because a lot of the work they do requires them to research to ensure that the information they, they're using is accurate. Yeah. So then they start to question a lot of other things that's happening in their homes. And many parents are not comfortable when their authority as a parent is being questioned. So like, why yeah. do we have to do this, mom? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, I've been doing this for the last 30 years. Why are you asking me now? <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, I suppose that that's going to, it's going to cause conflict in the home yes. and, and people can blame the university because it's an easy like scapegoat, I suppose. Yes. You know, it's uh, like. You're learning all this rubbish or, you know, you're listening to your friends. She um, she was fine yeah. before she went to to this this college yeah. and then she got all these newfangled ideas and more it's she's just exposed to new ideas and a different way of thinking that yeah, yeah. it's more the different way of thinking and the different way of looking at information as well yeah yeah exactly it's just not yeah. just accepting information from authority figures but really analyzing it and yeah I think that maybe those people could probably benefit from also going to university that would be <laughs> <laughs> helpful for them and we also see in places like uh america at the moment um a lot of mm -hmm. censorship of certain books or changing textbooks like the changing science the historical and, facts <laughs> yeah yeah changing historical facts and and changing you know scientific information to not include things like theory of evolution how, how do you improve that or approach fixing that issue i think the question that needs to be asked to those people who are making these changes is why do you need to change it yeah how is changing it going to be significant to you and to all of us what difference would it make so is it a fear factor that because if people know this, they're going to see things differently or they're going to learn the truth and you don't want them to know the truth? I kind of wonder if it's also not just like, you know, afraid of people learning the truth, but a rejection of it as truth. It, they just, they, they can't, like on some fundamental level, they go, no, that's not true, you know, and which is crazy when it comes to especially historical facts where you go, Yes, it is. That happened. You know, yeah. you can't just say that that didn't happen. And but yeah. So I, I guess the way around it could also be to prove to them that whatever they want to re remove is not a good thing to do or not the right thing to do. For example, there are people who believe that the world is flat, right? Mm -hmm. And they would, uh, for example, deny that gravity exists because. If gravity exists, then the world can't be flat because, you know, it's just a conflict of ideas. Yeah. So if you prove to them that gravity exists, then if gravity exists, the world isn't flat. You know, that's a way of challenging their thought processes without first addressing what they are denying or they want to remove. Well, it sort of comes down to respecting of different cultures in a way. Like if you have a group of people who are all flat earth deniers and they go, well, we don't want our children taught that the earth is a globe because that conflicts with you know what we believe to be true it's sort of like how do you how do you contend with that how do you go do, do you say that that it's their right as parents or as, as people within a, a cultural community to pass on those beliefs or do we have a moral obligation I suppose to to the truth and to communicating that truth well, personally, I think all of us are entitled to the truth. 
every child needs to know the truth. And, you know, um, truths differ for each of us. What's true to me may not be true to you. But at some fundamental level, we would all agree that some things are true. Um, yeah. You know, let's say, let's look at colors, for example. Today, blue is no longer blue, right? You've got shades of blue. Yeah. But, but fundamentally, we'll agree that, okay, you know, Rebecca's wearing a blue dress. And someone say, no, it's not blue, it's royal blue. No, it's not royal blue, it's, you know, I don't know. But yeah. we agree. Basically, it's blue. So I think that's one way of looking at it. Let's agree on the fundamentals. Yeah, and I then, suppose that that's, you've got to, like, get to that basic level of yes. this, is, this is reality and then you can step then we move from that, that. yeah, you yeah. Know, so if we all agree this is it okay so let's see why do you think it's this or the other and then let's discuss it have a mature conversation around it so do you think that the, it's it, the important thing is maybe teaching the scientific method or the, a way of analyzing information yeah, so the scientific method is obviously one way of doing it. And then there's the mathematical method, right, where you calculate things and then you see the difference. And then, of course, there's also the, I think, uh, of a psychological way of where we look at things, where we, are, we take away the emotions, we take away our cognitive biases and all other fallacies that kind of create, you know, understandings that might be maybe inaccurate. So we probably yeah. got to do them in tandem because each person, every community operates in a very different way. That makes sense. I mean, I suppose you, you, you sort of come to like, you know, from the psychology angle to like a postmodern understanding of, of truth where, you know, everything is subjective, reality is yeah. subjective. So, you know, it, it's sort of difficult to, to grapple with, I think, Um but yeah, I, I think that there's definitely valuable in seeing that maybe the data itself is an objective truth, raw data, yes. but how people are interpreting that data and understanding it themselves internally is going to be a very subjective thing and it is going to be different. Yes. You know, yeah. it's like when politicians tell you, you know, most of the people are not happy. And then you go, most? Really? And then you look at the data and then it says 55% are like, come on that's that's 45 percent. that's still you know happy. yeah so yeah yeah so it, then it, you said that's not majority if he said it was 80 percent, then maybe i'll accept that you know so again this understanding of what's many or what's a lot is relative yeah i mean even with that you also go what's unhappy like is it i have sad days occasionally or is it i'm unhappy with this specific you know, with yeah, the how do you measure it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's all. It's so many subjective things. How did you get the information? You know, did you yeah. just ask people? Uh, that, were they basing that just on how they felt at that moment? Were they maybe unhappy because they didn't want you asking questions? You know, like the, there's so <laughs> yeah. many different factors that influence it. So that's um, yeah, it's it's a huge undertaking to sort of unravel everything and yeah so there are many layers to this and also you you've got to go right down to the core to understand things yeah yeah Yeah. so you you sort of have to unwrap all of the things that are between you and and the actual facts of of the matter and, and go okay well I've got these biases so I need to set them aside and you know there was the people conducting a study had these biases so we need to yeah it's it's all very um complex complex <laughs> exactly because even with scientific data you need to understand the method of collection yeah the testing the reliability and then you need to see the sample size you know the population and whether that data is actually something that's reliable like you can say okay this is acceptable you know we can use this and yeah. they can measure what they were supposed to measure <laughs> I think that's an issue as well with um, science journalism. I think that they, there's a tendency to sensationalise articles that they're not really saying what the headline suggests, as yeah. an example. Is that something um, that you encounter a lot? Um, not so much, but what I wanted to share with you, Rebecca, because just to come back to what you mentioned a while ago, you see with the scientific approach, it's also a method of indirect proof. And a lot of people don't realise that. Right. So it's X and Y. 
So if X isn't true, then Y is true. You know, it's indirect proof. So when you go on that basis, again, someone else might say, I'm testing Y and Z, or why is that? And Y isn't true, so Z is true. And the layman goes, what's going on here? Last yeah. week you said Y is true, now you're saying it's Z. What's next? You know, because people don't understand the process as well. How, how would you say, like, you know, for people listening at home, what would you recommend that they do to try and understand those processes and, and get a better understanding of science and how it works? What I would suggest is, you know, when you read something and they say, let's say, X is not true, Y is true, go find out what's X and Y and what were they comparing as well. And when yeah. you read something else that tells you Y is untrue and Z is true, is that Y the same as the previous Y you were reading about? Or is it two different things? So basically dig deeper. Don't accept the headline. Just dig a little bit deeper. Go find, find out. out. Yeah. And go find out how many people were involved in that study as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So basically be curious, I suppose. Don't don't just, you know, accept things on the face of it. Yeah. That's... I mean, I think we all have to remain curious throughout our lifetime because if we stop being curious, you know, we're not going to function as effectively as we can. We need to maintain that sense of curiosity because otherwise we just sort of become stagnant. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like, why? Why not? Those are yeah. very easy questions to ask, but they give you a lot of insights. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. But thank you so much for, for talking. Oh, it's been great talking to you, Rebecca. I really enjoyed myself. That's good. Thank you. <laughs>